Hi, everyone. My name is Pam Lahoud. I am a program manager on the SQL Server engineering team, um, formerly known as the Tiger Team, hence the ears. And we are going to talk about in-memory database or in-memory features or in-memory technologies. We haven't decided what exactly we're going to call this yet, but in-memory in SQL Server. Um, you can silence your cell phones, but I don't mind if you don't. <laughs> Um, I hope you've already explored everything PASS has to offer. Um, it's been a really fun week for me, and it's really, on honestly, it's just great hanging around with SQL Family, so I hope everybody has enjoyed their week, and I really appreciate you rallying on a Friday um, to come to you know, the last sessions that are here this week. Um, so like I said, I'm in the SQL Server Engineering team. I focus mainly on the storage engine area. Um, we work on things like TempDB. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been working with SQL Server for my entire career, which is like over 20 years now. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at SQL Goddess. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is in-memory database. So when I say in-memory database, what do you guys think about? Hecaton. I heard somebody say Hecaton. How many people know what Hecaton is? How many people know what in-memory OLTP is? Slightly more people than knew Hecaton. So Hecaton is the code name for in-memory OLTP. And so that's something that came out, what, SQL Server 2014? 2014, right? So, so that's our, that was uh, one foray into in-memory. But it's specifically in-memory OLTP. And one of the confusions about in-memory OLTP or Hecaton is everyone's like, okay, great, my data is in memory and that's what makes it fast. And that's not really the case. <laughs> that's not the only thing about Hecaton or about in-memory OLTP that makes it fast. And so we went, when we say in-memory database, it's not like your database hasn't always been in memory. Your database has always been in memory as long as we've had SQL Server. Why? Because you have a buffer pool. Okay, so the majority of the data, um, the, sorry, the majority of the memory taken up by the SQL Server process is taken up by the buffer pool. And the whole point of the buffer pool is to serve as an in-memory data cache for your tables and your indexes and your objects so that we don't have to be continually reading them off disk. Okay, so even in you know, the oldest versions of SQL Server, we were always reading your data from memory. And so if you're executing a query and you need to find a page and it's not in the buffer pool, you have to do what's called a physical read, right? And that reads the page from disk. And where do we put it? We don't send it right back to your query. We put it in this buffer pool. And then you read the page from memory. And then later when you query again for the same data, it should already be in the buffer pool. And therefore, you're doing a logical read. So you are already doing reads from memory for most of your queries. And in fact, if your database is smaller than the amount of memory SQL Server has, chances are your entire database will be sitting in memory if it's all being used. Obviously, we only put the pages that are used in here. But the point is, your data has always been in memory. And because we use memory here to speed up your queries to prevent us from having to do a huge amount of I.O., there's a few hoops that we have to jump through to also make sure that your data is, is durable, right? Because that's one of the guarantees that we have in SQL Server is that when you write something to SQL Server, we have to guarantee that it's going to be there. Even if the server crashes, when it comes back up, as long as your transaction was committed, that data still has to be there. So it has to be durable, which means it has to be on some sort of persistent storage like a disk, okay? So even though we use memory to make it faster, we still have disk storage with your traditional SQL Server engine. So of course, when you modify data in SQL Server, you have to log things in memory first. First we enter it into the log cache, and then we take the page, if it's not already in the buffer pool, we put it in the buffer pool, and then uh, we make the modifications in memory first. This is all happening in memory. And then we have to flush things out to the transaction log, again, because this is for that durability thing. If the server were to crash, we're going to lose all that memory. So we flush things out to the transaction log. And then sometime later, there's a checkpoint. And those pages that are dirt now dirty in memory are then flushed out to disk. 
So if you've been working with SQL Server for a long time, hopefully you're already familiar with this process. This is kind of bread and butter for how the database engine works, okay? So the one myth that I wanted to dispel with that little conversation is that when we talk about in-memory database, all we're talking about is stuffing your data in memory. That is not true. The idea behind an in-memory database is is really going beyond the, the, what the constructs of disk require us to do. And it's about thinking about the future and the hardware that's coming in the future and how can we uh, reimagine the database engine for a future that has all different kinds of storage types, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so, it, what it, so, so, so okay, so I told you what I said an in-memory database is not. It's not just stuffing your data in memory. So what is it? Well, the, the initial premise of in-memory database is that it primarily relies on main memory for data storage versus an RDBMS that, that primarily relies on a disk mechanism. So the SQL Server engine has been primarily disk. In other words, we assume that your data is stored on disk we do leverage memory to make your data access faster, but the assumption is that it's on disk. And so by making that assumption, we have to, we uh, you know, um, design the engine in a certain way to uh, accommodate that. You know, the, the, the design choices we make in the engine are all based on that assumption. So when we change that assumption to say, okay, what if we flipped it and said, okay, let's, let's imagine that everything's in memory already. What can we do differently? And so that's our journey to in-memory database. And there's a lot of features. And this journey started, honestly, in SQL Server 2012. I mean, this has been ongoing for a while, but we've never really had a coherent story about this. And so that's what we want to talk about, is what I want to talk to you about today is not necessarily you know, all the individual features, although we, all gonna, we are going to talk about what they are and what's new in 2019. But I also want to kind of talk about this journey as a whole and let you know that when you hear in memory in SQL Server or when you hear in memory database uh, with relation to SQL Server, we're not just talking about either just stuffing your data in memory and we're not just talking about Hecaton or in memory OLTP. We're talking about just kind of a new way of thinking about the database engine. So, and this all comes from hardware innovation that's coming out. Uh, today. Uh, hardware is changing rapidly, especially data storage, not just disk storage, but memory. And so with that innovation, we have to think about how do we bring that database engine along? How do we innovate the SQL Server database engine to take advantage of this new hardware? Because we could just incrementally tune it forever and just make the, exist the way it works now just work better. We can keep doing that, but how much further could we go if we really stop to think about how could we do this in a big way, in a better way? So uh, in the modern era, what, what I'm talking about in the modern era is what you have now are servers with massive amounts of memory. I mean, we have customers that have you know, 30 terabytes of RAM and you know, huge numbers of processors. And this idea that we, we can't always have all of our data in memory, that is kind of becoming a thing of the past. So we really have to think about how do we get outside that box. So what we're gonna talk about today is like some of the reimagining. So what, what would storage, what does data storage look like? What does the query processor look like? How do I, how can resiliency change? Like are there any changes to high availability or is there anything new that I can do there if I reimagine how this database engine works? So let's talk a little bit about the journey. Okay, so what changes if we assume data is in memory instead of data on disk. So the first thing is, do we really need pages? Okay, what's a page in your database? What is a page? What am I talking about when I say a page? 8K, right? It's a block of what? Data storage, right? So your data file is broken into 8K pages, and we mimic that in the buffer pool um, because remember, the buffer pool is basically just a cache for your data pages, right? So if, you, if, you're, if your data file is broken up into 8K pages, we also break up the buffer pool into 8K buffers so that we can copy a data page directly into memory. So that 8K becomes your unit of transfer between disk and memory. And it's been that way like as long as I've worked with SQL Server. It's, it's been 8K pages. But if all the data is in memory, 
what would be the point of breaking it up into 8K pages? Like, would we really need to do that? And if we can think about uh, getting beyond that page structure, what does that change? How does that change the way we can access those queries? How does it change the way we do things like, you know, concurrency, for example? Like right now, if you, you know, you know if you modify a row, you have to lock the row. But when you modify that row actually on the page in memory, you have to lock the whole memory page. 8K of memory is locked to change that one row. Why? Because that's our, that's our unit. That's, our, that's the smallest unit that we have. So when we want to modify that page in memory, we have to protect it from anyone else modifying at the same time. Even if they're not touching the same row that we're touching, we have to latch that whole page. We call it a latch, page latch, right? We have to latch or lock that whole page. And so even if somebody's touching a row that has nothing to do with us, we may be blocking them simply because we're blocking this memory structure. And why? Why? The reason we do that is because that was an efficient way, doing those 8K blocks was an efficient way for us to manage I.O. It was an efficient way for us to transfer data between disk and memory. But that was at a time when we had to assume that the data was always on disk. What if it's in memory? That page doesn't really make sense if your data is always in memory. We can do it a different way. We can do it a better way. So we can rethink that. So page concurrency is one thing, but also um, disk I.O. then just becomes durability only, right? So if your memory is, is volatile, then we do still have to have some kind of disk structure. But now we can think about it not for data storage, but simply for durability. So how does that change how I do I.O.? Maybe I only have a transaction log. You know, maybe I don't even need the data file. Because right now, if you think about it, with your transaction log and your data file, you're, you're, you're like writing data twice. You have to write it in the transaction log because it's fast. But then later, you have to write it in the physical data file. What if you didn't have to do that? You know, so, so these are the kinds of things that we can think about when we start saying, let's throw away these old assumptions. So another one is, database engine is no longer focused on minimizing memory usage. So when you think about a query plan, um, most of you, if you're not using column store indexes, if you're looking at a query plan, all of those little operators in that query plan are doing row by row operations. They iterate one row at a time. And one of the reasons for that is to minimize the amount of resources that they take when they are, when we're processing queries. Because, you know, a, a long time ago we only had a, a small amount of memory. So, and we needed it for data cache and all these other things. So we couldn't use it for, uh, we couldn't use, you know, massive amounts of it for query processing because that could cause issues. So we do this row by row iteration so that we can keep that small. But what if we say, you know what, we've got 30 terabytes of RAM on this system now. My database is only one terabyte. What, what if I could leverage all this memory to do query processing faster? What if instead of row by row, I can do batches of rows at a time using vector operations? Yes, it's going to use more memory, but I've got memory to spare now, so why am I you know, focusing on keeping resources low when I can think about, I could do this query so much faster. I could process so much more data in the same amount of time if I leverage this big amount of memory I've got and, and all of these cores that I have to the best of my ability. Okay, so, and you know, and that may not be for everybody. You might not have giant queries that need to do that. So that's why we have kind of both uh, an idea of column store for, data warehousing type queries and in-memory OLTP for transactional queries because they may have two different needs, but they're both about rethinking how we can use this hardware to get your queries processed faster. Okay, so the other thing is index structures can change, right? Because again, I'm not beholden to this page structure. I'm not so much worried about using up memory. I can change my index structures and I can add these new query processing models. Okay, so, that's kind of the premise that started this journey, is really thinking outside the box and thinking, how can we do things better uh, given these new assumptions? Okay, so the first innovation was in-memory column store. And this was uh, SQL Server 2012 when in-memory column store came out. And I remember when I learned how it worked, I thought, why are they calling this in-memory column store? Because it is all in the disk. Column stores are all stored on the disk, but they're, it, they're completely different than the way uh, your traditional tables and indexes are stored. So um, in-memory column store literally flipped 
the data, right? It flipped it on its end so that we start storing data in a column-wise way rather than row-wise. So normally on your data pages, you have the whole row being stored and all of the columns for that row are together. But with a column store index, we store whole columns together. So uh, this allows us to do a lot of things as far as optimizing I.O., like it improves compression. It also allows you, if you're only querying one out of 100 columns in the table, it allows you to only pull in what you need. So this is good for I.O., but I'm also gonna keep going and we can talk about how, how this impacts memory and how I figured out why, oh, I get why it's in memory now. Okay, so the way this works, and remember, column store is designed for very large data sets. So the way we do column store is um, we break your data into row groups of one million rows each. And so we separate out into columns, then we separate out into rows, and we create what's called segments based on these row groups. And we encode and compress each one of those segments, and then we store it in blobs. So the unit of transfer between disk and memory for a column store is not an 8K page. It's a whole segment. So a segment of data represents one million rows. So again, we're thinking about, okay, we know we have a large amount of data to process because it's this big column store index. How can I do this more efficiently? If I read this data 8K at a time, 8K pages at a time, uh, what if it's fragmented? What if it's all over the disk? Like, you know, where would it be? So now I'm thinking, okay, I can, I can bring a whole segment into memory. I've got plenty of memory. So I'm working at the segment level rather than uh, you know, at the page level. I'm rethinking storage. I'm no longer thinking about that little 8K box. I'm thinking about how can I really process this mass amount of data very quickly using the resources that are available. And I build this segment directory which uh, stores metadata about the segments. So this even allows me to do things like filtering at the storage level. So rather than having to read the data into memory, look at it and go, oh, that's not the data I wanted, and then now it's taken up my buffer pool, now I can actually push down predicates. In some cases, I can even push down aggregates to the storage, and I can do that calculation before I even read the data. So I'm just I'm thinking more smartly about I.O., and I'm, but I'm also kind of leveraging this um, you know, large memory to store things differently. So what ends up happening in, co with column store is you build this, ob this object model which is very different than, than what you would have with your traditional tables and all of that is sitting in memory. So even though the data is stored itself on disk, you know, all of this metadata and all this segment directory and all of this is all held in memory and this allows us to you know, be much more efficient with how we access that data. So this was really the first, in my mind, kind of out of the box thinking that came, um, you know, with the database engine in 2012. So that's in memory column store. So this is the one that we started with, in memory OLTP. This is the one that everyone thinks about when we say in memory database and SQL server. So in memory OLTP came in 2014, and it was codenamed Hecaton, and a lot of people still call it that. Um, and this was a rethinking, so column store is a rethinking of data warehousing because with column store, as I said, you're dealing with large data sets. So the idea is you're processing large amounts of data at a time. And that's where that batch mode processing comes in, that vector processing, being able to process large amounts of data. But when you have an OLTP system, you don't generally process large amounts of data. Usually your queries are either a single row or a small set of rows. You're doing very frequent inserts, updates, and deletes, and it's not you know, the time it takes to process the data that's the problem, it's concurrency that's the problem. Because if you have large number of processes all trying to operate on the data at the same time, you start getting blocking and latch weights and all kinds of stuff because all these threads are all trying to touch the same physical data structures at the same time. So to think about how to solve that problem, we had to go at that in a different way. Column store is not gonna solve that problem because you're dealing with these giant segments of data. That actually could make concurrency worse if you're doing updates, right? So that wouldn't work for OLTP. So for OLTP, we thought, okay, well, I mean, our data is already in memory because it's already in the buffer pool. So we can't just make it faster by pinning it to memory. We used to have something like that. If you've been around for a while, there used to be this DBCC pin table and it was a way that you could stick a table to your buffer pool, yeah, great, it's in memory, but like I said before, if you've got enough memory, your database is already in memory anyway. That doesn't solve the concurrency issues. So with in-memory OLTP, we said, okay, 
Well, if the data is guaranteed to be in memory, if we load it all into memory at startup, so that once your workload starts coming in, we know it's in memory and we don't have to do any sort of disk transfers, remember that throwing out that concept of the page? We don't need to store data on pages because it's all in memory. So we can just store the rows as tuples, just single rows, and then we can use pointers to create the logical structures of your tables and your indexes because there's no need for physical structure for anything other than durability in this case, right? And if you have a non-durable table, I don't have to store anything on disk at all because if it's not durable, if I don't have to guarantee that it survives a reboot, then I don't need it to be on disk. Disk is only for durability. So with in-memory OLTP, I can say, okay, only do disk I.O. when I need it. If I'm doing like maybe session state or staging table or something like that and I don't care about the data, I don't have to write it to disk. And that saves you a lot. But also, this idea of operating on rows as atomic units rather than having collections of rows on pages, this opens up so much in the way of concurrency. So the real win for in-memory OLTP is not the fact that your data is in memory. The real win is what that assumption allows us to do in the database engine. And what it allows us to do is optimistic concurrency. So there's no such thing as latches in in-memory OLTP because there's no such thing as pages. All we have is rows. And to get around the locking issues, we said, okay, what if we just use optimistic concurrency? So what that means is we're gonna, we're gonna just assume that nobody else is using this data and we're gonna operate on it. And if we have to modify it, we're gonna use row versions. Okay, so you have a, you know, a data, a row in your uh, in-memory OLTP database. Whenever we modify it, we mark it with a timestamp for when we modified it. And so what you see here in the slide is we have each row will have a begin timestamp and an end timestamp. So the beginning timestamp is the time that that row came to life, and the end timestamp is when that row was no longer valid. So if I insert a row, it gets stamped with the begin timestamp of the time I inserted it. If I update a row, I don't update an existing structure. What I do is I just update the existing row with the end timestamp for the time that I update the row, and then I insert a new row with that same time as the beginning timestamp. So now I have two rows. I have the old row and the new row. Anybody whose transaction started before mine can still see the old row. Anybody whose transaction starts after my modification gets the new row. So everything's based on timestamps. Whatever the time of your transaction is, that's the, that's the valid data that you see, okay? Now, what about indexes? Well, indexes just become lists of pointers. I don't need to have separate physical structures. I don't need to copy the data. An index is really just a logical ordering of the data. When you have indexes in traditional tables, you actually have to build these objects out of pages. But this is all in memory, so we build these logical structures out of pointers. So it doesn't take up extra space. You don't take up, you don't copy the data to create all these indexes. So that's a way we can more efficiently use memory and we can more efficiently do updates and even your logging gets more efficient because we don't have to log any physical changes. We don't have to do page splits. We don't have to do all that kind of overhead that comes with uh, persisting data into a data file. So in-memory OLTP is really about how can I process data, transactional data quickly with minimal friction to concurrency. And so that's where the speed comes from, from in-memory OLTP. Not from be data being memory resident, but because uh, what that assumption of data being memory resident allows us to do in all the other structures surrounding that data. Okay? Oh, sorry. So, yes, optimistic concurrency and indexes are logical pointers. So any questions about that so far? That's kind of where the history that I wanted to set up for you before we move on to what's happening today and tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, they're together in the same structure. I just did that because the row header is really what I wanted to focus on here. Oh, okay, so the question is every time you add an index, it has to modify every single row. Right, which is why in in-memory OLTP you can't alter anything. You have to uh, basically drop and recreate because 
it, not only is it all pointers, but because this is all in memory, this code gets compiled down into DLLs. So um, we pre-compile a lot of this. That's the other part of the speed. I wasn't gonna go into huge detail on this. By the way, I think Kaylin's session's already done, but Kaylin did a big session where she goes into detail, Kaylin Delaney on this. So I didn't wanna go into too much detail, but also this is also being compiled down into native code. So when you create your in-memory OLTP table, we actually compile that down into a DLL. So any changes you wanna make are, are a drop and recreate. Now we did light up alter syntax, I think in 2016, something like that. Yeah, we did light up alter syntax, but what that alter does in the background is drop and recreate. Creates a side structure, copies the data, and then drops the old one, okay. Question. Is the entire database in memory or only a portion of it? I haven't gotten to talking about non-volatile memory yet. So this is just traditional old school stuff. So uh, the way that in-memory OLTP works is if you want to have, um, you, if you want to leverage it, because it can, this can operate with traditional data storage as well. So in that database you would create what's called a memory optimized file group, and then you would create memory optimized tables. So only the memory optimized tables will be in memory. In the back. Yes, I have a ton of material which I was literally developing until the minute I walked in the door, so I will upload it after. <laughs> okay. Was there one more question? No, okay. Great. All right. So that's what I wanted to set us up for. So, so that's the innovation that's happened up to now. And so what, what we're doing today is we're really taking, the, we're trying to take this journey forward in a big way. And we're trying to expand it out into where else in the database engine can we make these changes? Where can we leverage the innovations that we've already made? And what can we do in the future given the stuff that's coming on the horizon? And so you may have already heard some of these features. I've got Pedro sitting in the front row who talked about intelligent query processing with Joe Sack and we talked about it in the, in the keynote as well. And you might have heard batch mode processing there. It was always for column store. Now we can do batch mode processing for row store for your regular indexes um, in 2019. Uh, so that you can take advantage of that innovation. So we're starting to open that up into other parts of the engine so that we can take advantage of this, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, extra memory in other places in the engine. So batch mode on row store is one thing. And another big thing that we did in SQL Server 2019, which is near and dear to my heart, is to use these um, hackathon or in-memory OLTP innovations to help optimize TempDB. So how many of you uh, have had to deal with TempDB contention in the past? Yeah, pretty much every hand <laughs> just went up. It's a super, super common problem in TempDB. And there's many different types of contention in TempDB and we address them in different ways. So the first is object allocation contention. And this is what happens when you're creating and dropping a lot of objects and we need to allocate space for those objects in the database. And because TempDB is one of those databases where you're constantly creating and dropping objects, you can get contention on these special pages that are used to allocate space. So if you've done any research on this problem, you'll see you get contention on PFS, SGAM, and sometimes GAM pages. These are these special uh, object allocation pages. And so um, this is a problem that we've had. I mean, it really became a huge problem in SQL 2000. It, it, it was there before, but that was when it really became big because we had a lot more you know, multiprocessor systems running. So anybody know what you do to get rid of object allocation contention in TempDB? Add files. add files, right, add files. So the reason for that is when you add files, we partition the allocations across the files in like a round robin fashion. And so you have allocation pages for each one of those files. So we're effectively partitioning those allocations across files, and that allows us to do more concurrency. That's not even a disk thing, by, by the way. It's not I.O. It's all in memory, because these pages are in memory. We're just having contention in memory. Because this is, remember what I was talking about before. When we have an 8K page, you have lots of rows on that page. Only one thread can modify that page at a time. So even if it's separate rows, if you have multiple threads, they're all gonna be hitting that page and you get contention there. So whenever you have, and this is just basic computer programming, whenever you have a, a contentious object, one way you can solve that contention is by partitioning it. And so that's what adding 
multiple files does. And so, you know, for the most part, adding multiple files should fix your contention. Um, and you shouldn't have any issues. We are introducing some new things in 2019. One is um, concurrent uh, updates to PFS pages. That also helps. We made some trace flags default behavior. So you might have remembered in the old days you had to enable trace flag 1118, which um, avoids the SCAM pages by doing only um, full extent allocation. So that's one way to get rid of SCAM contention. So this has largely been addressed by you know, proper configuration of tempdb. Uh, but even more is coming there. But one that is not um, addressed by adding multiple files is metadata contention. So when you're adding tons of files in tempdb, uh, adding and dropping, uh, sorry, I should say adding and dropping tables in tempdb, uh, we have to modify the metadata for those tables. So it's just like a user database in that we track metadata for all of the objects that are there. Not only all the tables, but all the indexes, all the columns, you know, all the properties of all the columns. There's you know, several metadata tables that are involved in tracking that for, uh, for any user database and also for system databases like TempDB. So a similar problem can happen when you have that frequent you know, multiple threads adding and dropping uh, objects, we can get contention on these metadata pages. And it's the same kind of contention as the PFS contention. It's page latch contention. But this doesn't get solved by adding multiple files because we have one set of system tables. So you can't, I mean, we could partition system tables. That was one way to do it. But we decided to do something else. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then temp table cache contention is something that we started um, noticing, uh, once we started trying to fix the metadata contention, we started noticing that we have temp table cache contention. Because one of the things we did to solve metadata contention was to create a temp table cache so that when you drop your tables, we don't actually drop the metadata, we cache the metadata. Uh, and that worked for a little while, but basically we just shifted the problem to, the, to when we have to trim the cache. So, because you know, your cache doesn't live forever, we have to trim it. So now we get the metadata contention when we trim the cache, so really we just, push the problem further down the pipe. So uh, now we have a temp table cache, um, and we're starting to see contention on that. So in 2019, we've made a couple, by default, these changes are actually in the engine by default, changes to temp table caching to make that a little better. So we've done things like partition it, make it more efficient to look up things in the cache. So that is kind of a by default thing. But the one thing I really want to focus on is this um, metadata contention. So everything is cached, which means whenever, oh gosh, you're not going to be able to see that eye chart. <laughs> Let me see if I can zoom this a little bit. Okay, yeah. Okay. So when you drop um, a temp table, because we have this cache, we don't immediately drop the, um, the table itself. That becomes a no-op. So we just, uh, we cache the metadata. We do rename things so that you can, it can be reused, but we don't actually drop anything when you do that. And so what we do instead is we put things in a cache, and then when there's memory pressure, we move things out of the cache onto a deleted list. So the cache is really just a memory pool for, for storing temp table objects, but the metadata itself is still on disk. So what we do is we say, OK, we're evicting this thing from the cache, put it on a deleted list so that we have a cleanup process, a background process to come through and delete the actual metadata on disk. OK? So that's what we do. And then that background process fetches a row from, uh, from the deleted list and then goes and actually tries to clean up the metadata itself. So now what happens is all these background threads, and by the way, if the background thread can't keep up, Anybody who wants to create a temp table has to be a helper thread and help the cleanup process. So now we started getting contention on the cleanup rather than on the actual um, you know, creating and dropping of the object. So like I said, we just pushed it down the path. So we did make some changes so that now there's one thread per Numa node, and it helps for some people. Um, so if you're on older versions like SQL 2012 or SQL 2014, um, you may not have some of these newer cache innovations that we've done that can help with this contention. So 2016 and 2017, we made a lot of changes that, that help with this. But So you know, upgrading to those versions can help you. But what we decided to do in 2019 
was to, again, kind of rethink this. Okay, what's our problem? Our problem is latch contention. TempDB. What happens to TempDB when you restart SQL Server? Well, it gets recreated, right? It goes away. So that means it's non-durable, okay? So non-durable data means I don't have to write it to disk, right? And I'm having latch contention. What can I use that would make latch contention go away? Yeah, I saw some people go memory optimized up. Yeah, so what we decided to do in 2019 is turn all the metadata tables, all the system tables in TempDB into memory optimized, non-durable memory optimized tables. So we're taking that Hecaton infrastructure that we built in 2014, and we're using that in TempDB, not for your temp tables, but for the metadata, simply to get around this metadata contention. So by flipping a switch, by just turning this on, that contention should just completely go away, okay? So if you guys were at PASS last year, you might have seen in the keynote, um, the Bob and Connor did a demo called the Connor Fix, and it was, it was like this super awesome, made the workload go crazy fast. That was, that was an early version of this improvement of, of memory optimized TempDB metadata. So what I'll do today is kind of a, a more realistic version of that demo. I'm gonna go back to duplicate here. Make this a little easier. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, I have to do one more thing because I got old this year. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna execute a stored procedure that is, um, I think, kind of indicative of a pretty common TempDB workload pattern. So this is a stored procedure that creates a temporary table. And I insert uh, data into that temporary table. So I'm inserting um, some employee IDs, basically, uh, for people who have a, a birthday this month. Um, and then what I do is I select data for those employees by joining that temp table to a whole bunch of different tables in my database with some really complex joins. So this is kind of a common pattern that a lot of people use. It's like, let's build a list of things I need, and then let's go fetch data from like 10 other tables for those things. Pretty common TempDB scenario. So what we're gonna do is run that stored procedure at scale and see how that impacts uh, the server. So I'm gonna do this by firing off an OStress command, uh, and I'm gonna do that from the command line. Uh, but first, what I'll do is, is, let me clear this, and I'll start my perfmon. So I know this is gonna look like an eye chart to the back, so let me just zoom in quickly and show you what counters I have, and then I'll kind of tell you what the colors, oh, my, my zoom it works terrible inside a remote desktop, by the way. Come on. Okay, yeah. Mm. All right, I'm sorry, I'll have to tell you. So this, um, what I have in here is batch requests per second. Right now, not much is going on. In fact, what is that red line? Is that my processor? Yeah, I hope you're not installing updates in the background because that's gonna mess up my demo. So anyway, I've got page latch weights and batch requests per second, and the red line is processor time. So what I'm gonna show you is while I run this workload, what you're gonna see without memory optimized TempDB is you're gonna see latch contention on page latch weights. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and run the workload. Okay, so hopefully you can see that white line shooting up. That I can probably zoom in on. Okay, so that's our batch request per second. It's right around 300, you can see here. And then the, down here we have our page latch weights. Okay, now while this is running, something you can do in your, um, in your SQL servers is to look for this contention by looking at DM exec requests. And so what you're looking for is something that has a wait type, like page, but you need to know what the pages are. So um, in 2019, we also released another 
a new function called DMDB page info. And what this function allows you to do is you can cross apply with other um, uh, columns in the DM exec requests so that you can see what's in that page. So what it returns is the page header for the page so you can see what's on it. So let's just execute that. And what you can see here is we've got a whole bunch of page latch weights, but they're not on PFS pages or GAM or SGAM pages, so it's not that object allocate, allocation contention. It's a system table called Syschema Objects. So this is one of the really common types of metadata contention we have, and this is the thing that you cannot address by adding files, okay? Um, so if you are on older versions of SQL Server, the way that you would have to figure out what the page is is by using um, an undocumented command called dbcc page, which requires administrator access. So that's not super convenient, which is why we introduced this function. Okay, so there's our contention, and let's go back to the perfmon. It's still running. So if you look at um, the white line now is the batch request per second. So you can see it's kind of jagged. It's, it's obviously having some trouble. And you can see I had consistent, now I'm gonna highlight the page latch weights in white. I had very consistent page latch weights and uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the run. And now we, our workload is complete, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause this. Okay, so that took uh, one minute and 41 seconds. So now what we're gonna do is turn on tempdb, op memory optimized tempdb metadata. So this is the um, alter server configuration command that you would use to turn it on, and um, it requires a restart. So I've just got a batch file that's gonna do that for us. So let me come back here. And that's gonna turn on memory optimized tempdb metadata, and then it's gonna restart the service. So that takes effect. Okay, and we're started. So now if I come down in my notebook, I can select server property is tempdb metadata memory optimized, and that will tell me whether it's turned on or not. So let me just click play and verify. Yes, this is one, so it's turned on. You can also do this with SP configure. It's an advanced option, so you turn on advanced options and then SP configure tempdb metadata memory optimized. And if we run this, then you can see um, config value and run value are both one. So if we hadn't done the restart yet, then config value would be one, but run value would be zero. Okay, so we're fully hecatonized. That's what I like to call it. So let's go ahead and start the perfmon again. What was that? Get, I'm sorry, say again. Okay, the question is the tempdb that I've turned on, is it part of installation or do you have to install it separately? It's part of it, it just comes with SQL Server. Um, so it's just something that you would have to turn on and then you would have to, like I said, restart the server. Okay, so let's kick that off. And then now uh, the perfmon should look different. So notice the batch request per second has gone up significantly. So we were at around 300, now we're around 450 batch requests per second. You'll also notice that those page latch weights are virtually gone. So we had a little bump in the beginning, which was probably something other than tempdb. Uh, but now it's flatlined. So no page latch weights, and our batch request per second is higher. Also notice it's a little bit less spiky. We're able to maintain more consistent throughput because we don't have those page latch weights. And then if, you go, if we go here and we go back to our query, that looks for uh, contention, and I hit play, there are zero rows affected because there are no page latch weights. What was that, yep? If you have, so the question is if you have a four node availability group, would you have to turn it on for each node? Yes, you would have to turn it on for each node because it's stored in the, in the master database, that configuration, the database configuration, so. Why 
then you wouldn't, so what if you didn't turn it on in a secondary node and then it failed over? You wouldn't have the feature enabled, so you could in theory then suddenly get tempdb contention. Also keep in mind that um, on your readable secondaries, if they're readable, we're using tempdb for row versions. So it's, it may be important even when it's a secondary server to have this. So the bottom line is this is an instance level or a server level configuration, so it's not gonna follow your databases. Backup and restore would be the same thing. All right, so at this point we should see that it's finished. So it finished 30 seconds faster than the original workload and you saw, um, let me actually pause the perfmon before it rolls over. But you can see here it's much more consistent throughput and I'm able to push the CPU higher because I don't have those weights. And, and, so, and this is a really conservative example. Some customers are seeing like massive improvements, 10 times improvement because um, the less you do with that temp table, like if you just create a temp table, put one row in it, run a query and then you're done, that's gonna see even better improvement because most of your work is on the temp table itself. So those workloads can see enormous improvements from that. Yeah, go ahead. So is there any reason why you shouldn't turn it on? Why is it on by default? Yeah, the question is why isn't it on by default? Is there any reason you wouldn't turn it on? The reason we can't turn it on by default is there are um, two limitations that could, that are pretty narrow scenarios but could break code, and that is with Hackathon or within memory OLTP, you can't have cross database transactions. And so if you have a user database that has Hackathon objects in or memory optimized tables in it, and you create a transaction in one of those memory optimized tables, and then in the same transaction you try to query tempdb metadata, that would fail. Now, that doesn't mean you can't query a temp table. You can still access temp tables in a memory optimized transaction. You just can't access the metadata because the metadata would create a hackathon transaction. So if you like select star from sys.objects to see if a table exists, that might fail if it's inside an existing user database hackathon transaction. Now, if you're using object ID, that should work because that doesn't do the same kind of transaction. So, uh, so it, but, but the bottom line is, if we could think of even a few customers that we could break, we can't do it by default. So the other limitation is there's some column store limitations because of the way column store works with metadata. It does some unique things with metadata because of the segment directory. So because of that, uh, we don't support column store indexes on temp tables when you have this turned on. Now, I'm, I'm assuming most people are not building column store indexes on their temp tables. Um, the only place I've seen people do that before is because there's this trick where you can create a column store index where one equals zero. So you're not actually building a column store index, you're just doing that to get batch mode. But on 2019, you have batch mode on row store, so you shouldn't have to do that anymore. So hopefully that's also a narrow scenario. Um, the only other thing I can think that that would break is we do have a stored procedure called SP estimate data compression savings. And that supports column store indexes. The way that stored procedure works is by creating a column store index in tempdb on a temp table. So that stored procedure also won't work. So for this, so this is why, those are the two main reasons why we can't turn it on by default. Now the other thing is, keep in mind that we are putting your metadata in memory. So in theory you will be using more memory and how much memory you use is totally dependent on the activity in tempdb. So it's not something that we can anticipate. Now we've been doing our own testing, we've been doing extensive testing to see you know, how big the memory grows and we've never seen major issues with that. But you know, our customers tend to be a little more creative than us when it comes to how they use things. So we can't anticipate you know, what, those, uh, what, you know, what that memory footprint's gonna look like for all of our customers. So we do recommend that you test it. So that's just another reason why you wouldn't necessarily wanna turn it on until you tested it. So I had one question over here. Literally answered my oh, perfect. Okay, great. Okay. So is it memory allocation outside the buffer pool? Yeah, it, so when you create a, an in-memory, um, a memory optimized file group in a, in a database and you create Hecaton, it's, its, own, it's like its own memory optimized, it actually gets its own memory clerk and it gets its own memory area, so it's not buffer pool. It's, it, it literally works exactly as your user in memory OLTP works, the only difference is because it's non-durable, we don't need any data storage, so we don't create a file group on disk. Yes. 
Nope. So the tempdb. So the question is, can can we get rid of those multiple files for tempdb? And the answer is no, because that's for a different kind of contention. That's for object allocation contention. Now I hope to come back to you someday and say yes, you no longer need multiple files because we are making strides in those areas as well. Um, but I can't tell you that yet today. So today you still need your multiple files. Okay. Okay, so the question is, do we have any plans to backport this to like 2017 and 2016? The answer to that I can pretty much tell you is a hard no. Um, there are a lot of changes that had to go into place to make this work, and it's not trivial. Um, I mean, we worked on this for over a year, so I, and it's not easy, it's not something that's easy. It touches a lot of parts of the engine. We had to make changes to how in-memory OLTP works, so it, it's non-trivial, so I don't think this is a backport. And is this enterprise only? Yes, we did make this enterprise only. I know, I'm sorry. I had better news in the, in the accelerated database recovery session where I could say it was standard, but this one's not as enterprise only. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think I don't need my glasses anymore. Um, All right, any other questions on in-memory OLTP? I should also mention, um, as far as innovations with in-memory OLTP in 2019, um, most of what we did is back-end stuff to, to make the memory-optimized TempDB metadata work. There aren't really any other user-facing things. There is one change, though. Um, memory-optimized uh, tables used to, when you created a memory-optimized file group in your user database, we would then no longer support database snapshots of that database. That's now supported in 2019. So you can actually create a database snapshot of a database that has memory optimized file groups. However, giant caveat, you can't revert to that snapshot. So you can create the snapshot, but you can't use the revert keyword. Now you could copy data back in and you can still access the snapshot. You can't just use you just can't use the revert syntax. Yeah. So, okay, so the question is for, for memory optimized, for in-memory OLTP, is the data actually written to disk at some point? And yes, so the answer is yes, it has to be because it needs to be durable. When does it write to it? So when you checkpoint, just like you do in any other database, we flush things to disk. The difference is for in-memory OLTP, we, we write things out sequentially. So we're only writing like delta. So, so the data's on disk and then we have to write out the changes, okay? So we have like data files and delta files, so as you insert rows, we write them to data files, and as you delete rows or update rows, those get added to deleted bitmaps, and then, so we have these file pairs, and then over time we can merge the file pairs. So it's, it's, it's all sequential I.O., there's no in-place updating of anything, it's all, it's all write only, you know, append only. Okay, so it's a little bit different, but yes, we do. What's my advice on what to put in in-memory OLTP? That probably goes outside the scope of this conversation today, but feel free to, to, to see me afterwards and I'll have that chat with you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we have 20 minutes left, so we're gonna, that's probably more than my extent of knowledge on PMEM, but we need to talk about it here. That's the other big thing I wanted to talk to you about is PMEM or non-volatile memory. So I'm curious, how many of you out there already have some of these non-volatile memory PMEM devices in your data centers? One, two, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> because this is really new stuff for me. Um, so I was just hoping that I didn't have a room full of people who know more than I do, but. <laughs> um, so a PMEM, or persistent memory, is um, memory that is no longer volatile, meaning normally when you take power away from the memory, everything goes away, right? All of your data goes away. And that's the reason why we have to have both disk and memory. So the, the traditional uh, database engine, we were always thinking about two-tiered storage. You have slow, non-volatile storage, and then you have fast, volatile storage. That's your memory. So we use the fast, volatile storage while we're operating, and then we use the slow non-volatile storage 
to store data for durability purposes, so that if we do lose power, if the server crashes, we can guarantee that your data is still there. Now today, this line is blurring rapidly. Things that are changing are your disks are getting faster. We're getting faster and higher capacity SSDs, and they're getting closer and closer to the speed of memory. So we have non-volatile memory that is like storage level SSD, but now we also have memory or DRAM that's getting a battery backup so that it becomes non-volatile. So this is kind of converging. We've got memory that's, that's slightly slower but is now persistent, and we've got disk that's blazing fast that is almost as fast as RAM. So there's this wide range of innovation that's happening in storage. And so the line is being blurred between disk storage and memory storage. What we really have is a series of storage classes that have different properties like capacity and speed and volatility. Okay, so it's, it's really changing the way about how we look at data storage. Again, because we're, we're coming out of this two-tiered world and now we've got this whole array of, of properties to storage that we can think about and play with and how can, what, you know, what can we do in the engine to take advantage of these. So the big news for 2019 is the innovations we've done around persistent memory. So what I'm talking about with persistent memory is in this chart, it's called SCM, storage class memory. So that's a broad term that relates to any kind of persistent memory. So the main players out there are um, Intel Optane, okay? And then you also have something called NVDIMMs or non-volatile DIMMs. So the Optane has, has, is coming out with like big, big devices. The Envy DIMMs have traditionally been smaller, but even they're getting bigger now. So, so these are the two main players. So what this is, is basically memory that has a battery backup. So it's almost as fast as memory. It sits in a memory bus, not in disk. And it, uh, it allows us to operate on memory with the, with the idea in our minds that this is persistent. So it's already persistent. I already have durability. I don't actually have to write this out to disk. So we're just beginning this journey with the SQL Server database engine for how can we leverage this new technology. So that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit today. So here's where we're at with SQL Server and PMEM support. So on any version of SQL Server, you can have a PMEM device and you can have it operate as if it were a block device, so just as a disk. This doesn't change anything with SQL Server. We still see it as a disk, but it's a super fast, super fast disk. I hope my tea wasn't open when it fell. Okay. Oh, well, my tea's here. That was just my bag. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, so, so this is really just like super fast I/O. So your access to your data files and your transaction log files is fast. So you can get this with just like super fast SSDs, or like I said, you can configure a PMEM device as a block device and it's just a fast disk. So no real changes to the engine there. Now, in SQL Server 2016, we introduced something called persisted log buffer. So this is tail of the log, like PMEM for tail of the log. And so what this does is we have a log cache that we write to that, we, that then needs to be flushed to disk. So you remember early on I showed you that transaction log slide where I was showing you how the, you know, how the transaction moves through and gets flushed out to disk, and I said we do it in a log cache first and then we flush the cache, cache to your transaction log file. Well, your transaction isn't truly durable, it's not truly committed until it gets flushed out to disk. But what if that log cache was on a PMEM device? A PMEM device is fast, like memory, and it's persistent. So if I write to a PMEM device, the, that log cache, I don't necessarily have to wait for that cache to flush to disk before your transaction is guaranteed. So what putting your um, tail of the log on PMEM allows you to do is it's, it's basically like having delayed durability. If you guys have heard of delayed durability where we return before we flush the record, it's like delayed durability without the risk. As soon as we hit the log cache, we can return your transaction immediately. We don't have to wait for the flush. 
So that's what you get when you do this. And the way you would do this is just by creating a 20 megabyte file. You just put a PMEM device in your system, and then you put, you create a, an extra 20 meg log file, and you put it on that PMEM device, and we just pick it up. We recognize that it's PMEM, and now we can persist your cache to PMEM instead of having that extra flush step. So it's like getting delayed durability performance without the risk. Okay. So that's persisted log buffer, and that's in 2016. Now, 2019 also brings something called Enlightened I.O. And what Enlightened I.O. does is if you put your data and log files on a PMEM device using what we call, what's called DAX mode or direct access mode, uh, we can bypass the kernel I.O. altogether. So we are not going through the I.O. stack because we're talking to it like it's memory, direct access like it's memory. And so we can bypass that. Now, this is uh, for Linux right now because the, this is part of the Linux operating system and how it works. And so these are changes that we made to the PAL, the platform abstraction layer that allows us to run on Linux. So right now you get this on Linux. It may come to Windows someday, but Windows works differently than the Linux stack. So it's not, you know, it's not something that, that Windows is doing right now. So you know, this is kind of an influx thing. But right now, that's what we have um, to make I.O. Uh, faster on Linux. And then the last part is the one that I want to focus on in a little more detail in this session, and that is hybrid buffer pool. So also new in 2019, what hybrid buffer pool allows you to do is Take one of those PMEM devices, and again, it needs to be configured in DAX mode. Um, so when you, wh what happens is when you install the PMEM device and you format it with NTFS, you would set DAX equal to true, and that makes it a DAX device. And then when you do that and you put your data file on the DAX device, then we can access your database directly rather than copying those pages into the buffer pool because then it becomes memory, right? So why copy memory to memory? I don't need to do that. I can just access your data files directly. So let's think about what that looks like. So without hybrid buffer pool, it works like, I, like the very first slide that I showed you. Anytime we try to access a page of data, if it's not in the buffer pool, then I have to copy it from disk into the buffer pool and then I read it from the buffer pool. Then anyone else who wants to access that page, as long as it's in the buffer pool, will read it from memory, okay? Now, if I have hybrid buffer pool turned on, for clean pages only, meaning pages that don't have an in-memory modification, for clean pages only, I don't have to do that extra step of copying the data into memory. Because the PMEM device is memory fast, memory speed, I could just read the page directly from memory and not even put it into the buffer pool. So this is kind of like hardware accelerated buffer pool extensions, okay? It's not the same as buffer pool extensions. It's not a separate area. It's literally we just read your data files directly instead of making that extra stop in the buffer pool. Now remember, this is for clean pages only. So that means that for your old TP workloads, ones that do heavy reads and writes, those probably are not gonna benefit from it because anything that's writing to the page has to pull the page into the buffer pool. It's only for clean pages. So this is primarily for a data warehousing type workload where you don't have enough memory to sustain your, your, your um, you know, direct queries. So, so you have these giant queries that run frequently, they need pages, we don't have enough buffer pool, then that's when this becomes, um, this becomes a compelling solution. And one thing to keep in mind is that usually these PMM devices are slightly slower than RAM. So if all your data fits in RAM, then this is not gonna benefit you. This could actually hurt you because the PMM device might be slightly slower. But if all your RAM is already you know, being used up for other purposes and you don't have enough memory to support your queries, then this can really help you. So like I said, giant data warehouses, things like that. Also, it's available in standard edition. So if you have a buffer pool limitation in standard edition, you could put a PMEM device in there and get some extra buffer pool size for you. This is also for, for both, Lin this is both Windows and Linux. So the question was, this is just for Linux? This is for both Windows and Linux. Okay, yep. 
Am I aware, am I aware of cloud providers making this technology available? Yes, I know Azure will be soon. We're looking into it. I can't speak for any other cloud providers, but it's in the works. Okay. All right, so um, a couple of things. So I said clean pages only. It's not compatible with buffer pool extensions, so you can't do this on top of buffer pool extensions. Um, you can't use torn page detection. I hope you're not using torn page detection anyway. <laughs> but if you have older databases that have been upgraded, 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 and they've never been converted, um, then you might need to just make sure that everything is using checksum instead of torn page detection. It's not compatible with TDE, and the reason for this is the Intel Optane devices encrypt the data on the device, and so if we were to do transparent data encryption on top of that, there could be issues there. So for that reason, we recommend you do not do transparent data encryption, but because those Optane devices are doing the encryption for you, it, it shouldn't be an issue, but keep in mind that they're not all devices do that device level encryption, okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind. And you can't shrink database files when this feature is enabled. Oh, darn. No more shrink. <laughs> I know, I'm so sad. Can you tell? Yeah, right, sarcasm. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do you get it? Put your database files uh, on a PMEM device that has DAX mode enabled. Alter server configuration, set memory optimized hybrid buffer pool on. That turns hybrid buffer pool functionality on at the instance level. That requires a restart. So restart your SQL Server instance. And then you need to turn this on at the database level. So at the database level, the syntax is currently set memory optimized on. Don't get that confused with Hecaton or with in-memory OLTP. Set memory optimized on. Memory optimizes the database, doesn't add Hecaton. Okay, so that's what turns on your hybrid buffer pool. Once you do that, we just do it. There's no, like, you don't have to say, this data goes here, this data goes, nope, you just, anything that's on a PMEM device becomes hybrid buffer pool. Okay. More questions. Yes. Will this work with containers? I'm gonna, I, yeah, you could set the, but, but will the container know that the, that the device is a PMEM device? SQL Server does, through the container, yeah. Okay, so we need to come back to you on that. Um, either to, DM me on Twitter or something like that, and I can get back to you after I talk to the container guys. Other questions? Okay, cool. All right, so what does the future hold? All right, so PMEM enables both lower storage latency and increased memory capacity. So things are really in flux right now, and I was having a chat. I'm uh, just, um, ooh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm not the PMEM PM. He's at Ignite, so I'm doing this talk for him. He did a lot of these slides for me. And so we were having a chat, and I said, well, where are we going with this? And he's like, well, just the, the technology is so much in flux right now that we're not sure where the chips are gonna land. So he was throwing out things like uh, VHS versus Betamax, and I was like, I don't, know, I don't know how old the audience is. I guess we could say HD DVD versus Blu-ray, you know. The, the technologies that are out there are evolving rapidly, and it's, it's unclear even what our hardware partners' strategies are. I mean, they, they are obviously have strategies that are gelled, but it's, it's unclear how that's gonna play out for us uh, as we build out our database engine. So we are still kind of um, evaluating what are the best ways that we can do this. Some, some things that we want to keep in mind as we build out this strategy is obviously we want to give you real world performance gains. We don't want to just say throw everything on PMEM and hopefully it gets faster. We want to really look at what can we change, again, like I said in the beginning, how can we rethink the database engine to take advantage of this new technology? How can we get outside of that world of two-tiered, slow, volatile, slow, non-volatile, fast, volatile storage? When we start thinking outside the box, what does that look like? And you know, as we evolve that strategy, the hardware strategy is going to evolve as well. So this is this is obviously going to change over time. But what we want to do is make sure that we give you like tangible performance benefits using this technology in a way that's not overly complex. 
I don't want you to have to get like a PhD in hardware manufacturing to be able to make this work. I don't even want you to really know anything. I want you to just put the server in the database engine goes, oh look, I've got a PMEM device, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. Oh, I've got some really fast SSD, I've got this. The database engine should just work. And yeah, we'll probably give you knobs if you really want to tune it, but for the vast majority of people, we want them to just install SQL Server and it just works. We want to be able to roll this out into Azure and it just works. Okay, so that's kind of our idea is to, to do this in a way that makes sense and that minimizes complexity and that makes it manageable and easy for you to use. And obviously we want to balance also performance gains with cost. Because the reality is today these devices are very, very expensive. So it's like where does this really make sense for people and, and for different tiers of usage of the database engine? These are some of the things that we're considering as we go. And so where we land is unclear, but these are the innovations that we're making today. And of course, we're also welcome to your feedback. So I hope that you've gotten that feeling over the week is that not only are we here to talk to you, we're here to listen to you. So you know, if you have concerns or if you have ideas or things that you're interested in seeing, you know, we're, we're welcome to that, we're open to that for what would make you know, your life easier, what would make um, this more seamless for you. So absolutely, you know, deliver me your feedback if you have any. Okay, so that's kind of our vision. Um, just a little shameless plugging slide. Uh, my colleague Pedro and I recently wrote a book, T-SQL Querying, so if you are interested in performance tuning or writing better T-SQL, learning how to read an execution plan, that sort of thing, check out our book. Um, all of these links are ways for you to get more information, basically. So we've got lots of demos. Um, I didn't mention it, but what, when I was demoing the TempDB metadata, I was using a notebook in Azure Data Studio. Hopefully you've seen that all week with the Microsoft folks, right, presenting with notebooks. It is so much fun. It is the easiest way to do notebooks. It's a great way to do runbooks, troubleshooting guides, all that kind of stuff. So we've put out some notebooks for you with um, SQL 2019 notebooks, so aka.ms slash SQL 2019 notebooks. It's just a list of links to some of our favorite samples and demos, all in notebook, notebook format. We've also got one shortcut to rule them all. So if you don't remember any other shortcut, aka.ms slash SQL shortcuts, <laughs> and we've got them all. Uh, Pedro has an addiction to short links, so. <laughs> and then free training. I really can't stress enough how cool the content on SQL workshops is. So aka.ms WAC SQL workshops. That is content that the engineering team has developed for you. It is free for you to use. It's free for you to re-deliver. So if you deliver training, we you get paid for it. We don't even care. Just use this, this, use this training, use this content. You've got notebooks, you've got PowerPoint decks. It's all in GitHub. If you have issues with it, you can file issues directly in GitHub. We're maintaining that for you. There's lots of great content out there. And the main thing is we really want you to get the story of SQL Server, to learn this stuff, and to be able to use it and not just you know, buy it and wonder how it works. <laughs> so SQL workshops for that. Okay, and of course, session evaluations. If you, I would very much appreciate evaluations and please give me comments so that I can get better. I always like to do that with my presentations. And with that, thank you very much. I appreciate you staying through Friday with no coffee. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your summit. <laughs>